welcome back to every episode of Death Battle reviewed in 10 words or less. That's right, folks, we're back to our regularly scheduled program after some interesting hiccups. Hiccups got a name, by the way. Right, gotta get used to you being here with my consent. Remember, kids, consent makes all the difference. After season five and six both set Death Battle on a spiraling path to success, in came season seven to bring that momentum to a screeching halt. After three whole years of 16 episode seasons, the crew decided to shake things up by not only bringing the episode count to 20, but also having a mid-season break for DBX and Death Race, two things that I might have to talk about another day, cause let's be real, there's a lot to discuss. Did the increase in quantity dampen the previous season's increase in quality? Let's find out by taking a look at every episode from season seven in 10 words or less. Ready? Wait, 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 give me a second. <laughs> okay, we can start now. Go. They really capture the exaggerated swagger of a black teen. Sindel walking in here with that yee ass haircut. The epitome of children fighting with their action figures. Three things are inevitable. Death, taxes, and Genos losing. Anime where no one dies versus anime where everyone dies. Why? Why is this episode so badass? Time, huh? I'm appreciative of that useful piece of information. I've heard of brown nosing, but this is ridiculous. Jake did not stand a ghost of a gent. <laughs> Interesting episode to have a male enhancement product spot sponsorship on. Oh boy, can't wait to see the salt mines. Oh. Keep it in your pants, Wiz. We all stand Zuzu. Ugh, my brain feels like slurry. Way past stool. I love the boys, but does this even count? Bucky wore a mask before it was cool. Carnage versus Lucy, but worse. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll hug your mom. An accurate representation of the 2020 Electoral College. Today, the Cerulean Devil dies! <laughs> Well, should've seen that coming. Strangely one of the most satisfying death sequences. I feel like we're repeating ourselves. If we all needed to scream after that year. <laughs> uh, is that something I should worry about? Eh, not for a good 43 minutes and 44 seconds. Well, that was certainly something. I'm sure you can all guess by now why this has been deemed the gas leak season of Death Battle. It's not that it's the worst season, but it certainly feels uncharacteristic of a team that's been doing so damn well. The redesign of Wiz and Boomstick ruffled quite a few feathers for good reason, but fortunately they got way better over time. A lot more puppet animation was utilized with varying results. We even got our first sponsored episode of the show, which I'll talk about in due time. Honestly, with how up and down this season is, I think it'd be more apt comparing it to season four rather than three. The highs were really high and the lows were really low. Because of this, unlike the other seasons, I actually have something to say about every episode. Should I do a top 10 worst and best list? That'd feel dishonest because I don't think this season had 10 bad episodes and 10 good episodes. You know what? Screw it. I've made you guys wait this long, so instead of doing a top 10 with an arbitrary number of honorable mentions, I might as well go all out. I'm going to go the skate frillis route and do a full on ranking of the whole season. So buckle up ladies and gentlemen, this is gonna be a bumpy ride. And also a really long video, so let's go ahead and start counting. Batgirl vs. Spider-Gwen. Holy damn f***ing ass blasting f***ing smearing donkus. What the hell was that? Okay, I will be fair and say that this episode had a decent analysis. This episode is where we begin to see the first signs of this show's god-tier editing for comic characters, thanks to the legendary return of Nervous Nick. The jokes were pretty good, Drunk Dummy being a highlight, but every time the script made a reference to something like girl power, I wanted to vomit. It comes off as so, look how woke we are. Burly meatheads that are actually progressive feminists is a tire joke that only works with Knuckles. If you want to empower these characters, why did you choose a transition clip for Barbara where she's at a disadvantage? But the animation is the actual reason this episode scores so low. It's done by the SFM team, and now we know that this team, as godlike as their good stuff is, is still human. To put it plainly, this episode was not for them. They do their best when the characters have tons of abilities and are able to chew the scenery. Not intimate close quarters combat that tries to be cool, but feels like it's written by a troll playing Call of Duty. Why is Barbara such a jerk in this fight? I guess I'd be too, with a face like that. <laughs> 
Because this is SFM, jank and awkwardness is always inevitable, but since the team is clearly working out of their comfort zone, literally every movement in this fight is janky and awkward, which is especially bad for close quarters combat. The models are too floaty and lack weight, not helping is the overabundance of unnecessary slow motion. Though admittedly, Gwen's custom model looks pretty good. I'm aware the SFM team chose to do this one, but that does very little to justify this fight being 3D, and it feels like a waste of their talents. If they went for an Into the Spider-Verse aesthetic, I'd get it, but they don't even attempt to do that. Even the death stinks. It was almost cool, but then it got ruined by Barbara's unintentionally hilarious post-mortem face. Best of all, the choreography has even more stupid moments than Lara vs. Nathan. It pisses me off so much that I'm not even in the mood to do my Plinket impression. Ah, who am I kidding? Why did Barbara immediately try to kill Gwen? Why didn't she let her explain herself? This isn't the chum bucket. How does Barbara keep cutting through Gwen's webs? Aren't they stronger than steel? What was the point of this shot with the electric baton? It doesn't come into play later, so why show it at all? Why does Gwen let Barbara slowly put this weapon on her chest? Here, hold this. How come when Gwen goes invisible, Barbara just waits a few seconds and then throws the batarangs? Did she think Gwen would still be standing there? Isn't she supposed to be some kind of computer genius? Why does Gwen catch the batarang and not immediately throw it away? It's obvious she knows it's dangerous. What happened to your spider sense? Oh, I shouldn't have done that. It's no time for thinking, it's time for running, so I better move my feet and get the heck out <laughs> Why is Barbara's hand stuck here, but then unstuck in the next shot? Why did Gwen spend the entire fight running away? Who the hell would want to watch a fight where one of the character's superpowers is running away from their problems? Oh. It's obvious Gwen had her ass kicked the whole fight just to hide the fact that this result was obvious from the get-go. Gee, kind of like another fight with a bat in a spider. Why does this episode exist? Gwen was no match for her stellar intelligence, which made this pretty close. You sit on a throne of lies. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC, and we're doing a story on adults who try to meet teens online. Zuko versus Shoto Todoroki. One episode. Why can't we get just one good Avatar episode on this show? Three Strikes Death Battle, you're out. You know what sucks the most about this one? Unlike the previous entry, I, like many, actually wanted Death Battle to do it. Sure, it's not that fair, but it's absurdly thematic, which I've always found to be the most important aspect of any matchup. When this one initially came out, I probably would have put it at the bottom due to how disappointed I was from the missed potential, but after some rewatches, there are some genuinely good aspects I can't ignore. Like with Aang vs. Ed, the effects work on the bending is stunning, and the clashing colors of fire and ice is eye candy, and so is the hand-drawn stuff. Well, most of it anyway. The voice actors did a great job, which is a given in Zuko's case since they literally got Dante Bosco. They didn't even have to hide it this time. Frozen Fire is one of the best tracks we've had, the Just Like Me moment was perfect, and the ending pun is one of my favorites in the show. Not because of the pun itself, but specifically the character acting of Boomstick trying to come up with a pun, feeling giddy when he figured it out, and Wiz's eye twitch. Good shit. But here's where we get to bad shit. Another similarity this episode has with Aang vs. Ed is the setup. Now some of you might be thinking, why do you reviewers focus so much on the setup? It's just two characters beating the shit out of each other. No, it isn't. It's two well-known beloved characters with dedicated fan bases beating the shit out of each other. It's why Aang vs. Ed is so infamous. It turned one of the best shonen protagonists into a glorified short joke and made Aang, someone who spared a literal tyrant, say he had no choice when fighting a random guy on the street. For this episode, why am I supposed to buy that Shoto, one of the most level-headed members of his class, would try and kill someone over a mistake? And why does he still have daddy issues if we're looking at him at his prime? Remember when we thought this season was going to have good puppet animation? Those hopes went poof the minute the sneak peek dropped and we saw Zuko firebending. It looks awful! Even the JUS sprites used for Aang look better. The stiff and lifeless movement movements are especially noticeable when using two characters whose fighting styles are all about using different stances. And to round out our list of complaints is the analysis being weighed down by a whopping six Boomsticks dad jokes. Look, I get it. It sucks having a deadbeat parent, but that doesn't mean it's immune to the same principle that applies to all jokes. After a certain amount of repeats, you're going to get groans more often than laughs. At least these jokes are all confined to one episode and not permeated throughout a season, because holy shit, that would be awful. But that's small potato compared to what they did to Wiz. Just, uh, just watch. Now that he's the fire daddy, uh, Lord. FBI, open up! <laughs> 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 
did the crew seriously forget that Zuko, in a majority of his media appearances, is 16? How did not one person think this would be a problem? If you want to show Wiz's bye, that's all fine and dandy, but not like this. I know Zuko is a fan favorite, but there are better options from the season for Wiz to simp over. Like Broly, for instance. Heck, I know, I do. Oh, uh, I mean... <laughs> no, down boy! Magical lazy writing. She-Ra versus Wonder Woman. Remember how fun, cheesy, and interesting the last He-Man fight was? Yeah, throw all that shit out the window, cause this episode stinks. The only reason it's higher than Zuko versus Shoto is because I had a personal stake in that fight and came out incredibly disappointed. This episode just leaves me bored. We've ragged on this one a couple times already on this channel, and for good reason. We do get some moments of Wiz and Boomstick being baffled by She-Ra's powers, but it's not nearly as memorable as the banter for He-Man's analysis. To this episode's credit, it's not as boring as Wendy's last appearance. It's actually worse. While the visual upgrade is obvious and incredibly welcome, looking pretty doesn't make up for an absence of interesting set pieces or choreography. Nah, too easy. In He-Man's episode, we had cheesy dialogue that called back to the 80s and a freaking mountain getting thrown. In Wendy's last episode, there were storms, explosions, and Thor deciding to go higher by destroying the goddamn moon. Here, Diane's plane blows up, a couple trees get cut down, and that's it. What a poor way to show off these two characters' immense power. We don't even see She-Ra's sword transform into wacky-tacky 80s shit. The characters themselves aren't even likable because of how ridiculous their lines are. Where does Diane get off saying, Compared to an Amazon like me, you're just playing dress-up. And then immediately saying, <laughs> Get over yourself! You hypocritical asshat! If they really wanted to make decapitation look impactful, then why not show a close-up of She-Ra's atoms getting split, followed by an atomic explosion? Also, have her hair get cut as well, cause this makes no damn sense. Its score isn't lower, because, like I said, this episode does look amazing, the voices are fitting, and this one sequence in the forest is actually really great. Other than those aspects, this episode was not worthy of the princesses of power. Clever melee reference, at least. I said, are you done with that anime shit? How could I be? I haven't went eight gates yet. Sanji versus Rock Lee. <sighs> okay. On the one hand, the analysis once again does a great job of bringing life to comic slash manga panels, Boomstick using the drunken style is funny, the puppet animation has some great choreography, handsome Squidward meme, and a beautiful climax that's almost completely hand-drawn. On the other hand, Rock's custom sprites are awful and make him fat, Rock himself is incredibly out of character in the opening, his face turns red despite saying the curry is mild, the drunken style takes up too much time, the gates are flown through way too fast, most of the dialogue is cringe, and the acting is no better. The latter is really unfortunate, because it's not like these guys are bad actors on their own, they're articulate and capable of yelling intensely, though for some reason not when their legs get blown up, what? But Yang Yi is given Jack to work with despite sounding like Eric Vale, and Mark Phillips was a serious miscast, which really sucks because we know this man has charisma as well as a love for anime. What? Should I be dead? What? How is he not dead yet? I wrote the name and everything, what did I- <gasps> I forgot the last name. How could I be so careless? How could I- It's mostly just the dialogue they're given, and it leads to deliveries like- Picky eaters are the worst! Um, why is everything so loud? Rock sounds more natural when he's drunk, and that's really sad. It's a good thing I'm not a Naruto fan, because otherwise this episode probably would have pissed me off so much more. I can't even imagine how fans of Rock felt after this one. He rarely had a moment to shine, and wasn't utilized properly in terms of personality and fighting styles. I'd like to bring up the gates in particular. The way they're handled here makes me appreciate how they were used in Might Might so much more. First of all, it was a slow buildup, and we didn't just get them one after the other. Second, Might did it because the two fighters were amicable, and he felt All Might deserved a good battle. Here, there's no reason for him to be shooting through the gates like his life depends on it. It feels too rushed. Thirdly, notice how Mike Guy didn't bring out the eighth gate until he was on Death's door. He had nothing left to lose, so of course he'd go all out. Here, Sanji attacks him right after he activates the seventh gate, and Rock's like, I'd rather die in a few minutes than have to spend one more second with you, mister. Yes, his ribs break, but that hardly compares to having a fist through your chest. So yeah, plenty of good, plenty of bad, Unfortunately, the bad kinda outweighs the good for me. Thank God I wasn't invested in this one like I was with Zuko versus Todoroki. Well, I might know a certain somebody who was. Yeah, the puppet animations were kinda wonky and some of the delivery felt... Since you wouldn't finish your food, I'm making you cough up whatever you've already eaten. Off. But even with all that, I know my buddy was hyped to see the Sobo Mask transformation done decently. The rest, uh, could've been better, could've been worse. Shame Bullcut didn't get to keep that jawline, though. 
Black Canary vs. Sindel. Hey, Death Battle, could you do me a favor and stop making most of your female fights boring and bad? It doesn't look good on your end, and more importantly, it doesn't look good on my end. Though, to be fair, I don't know how you can make a fight like this interesting. I'm genuinely curious if this was on anybody's wish lists. Much like Dinah's significant other, it's tough to make a fight where the main weapon is slow projectiles visually engaging. To this episode's credit, it does its best with the concept, the power differences were shown off well, and this line gets a genuine chuckle out of me. So our ring out's a thing here? But pretty much every other line gets chuckles out of me and my friends for all the wrong reasons. Like, how am I supposed to take dialogue like this seriously? Such a pretty bird, with such an ugly son. Tell me, can you fly? Was it meant to be intimidating? Funny? Ironic? Who knows? Tell me, Nate. Can you fly? I mean, I've always assumed you could at least float. Anywho, the thing that ground my gears about this fight was Dinah. Sure, the voice actress was fine, whatever, but I bet however much money Deadpool 3 is gonna make that that woman either stole my script or poached my writers. I mean, Fight Club, Scooby-Doo, Fatality, come on, woman! You're quippy, sure, but quippiness don't give you fourth wall breaking powers. That's something you gotta earn. How did you earn yours? Push-ups, sit-ups, and plenty of brutal torture. Sorry I asked. This episode's biggest crime is being painfully average, as well as exposing us to these awful, awful Sindel sprites. The hair has no right being that big, and it makes her look as goofy as she sounds. No cap, the most interesting thing about this episode is its lesson on how decibels work. I was frozen today! Gray versus Esdeath. Why did I force myself to watch a Kame got kill for this one? It's not like it got me any more excited for it. This episode may have a killer music track, but that's the most standout thing about it. I've been told Esdeath acts out of character here, but even as someone who forced himself to watch her show, I honestly couldn't tell you if those claims are true. She mostly just sounds like a brat. You have no right to feel my boot against your face. The sprite work did a good job of making the atmosphere feel chilly, and this shot of the ice storm looks great. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the actual fighting has few highlights aside from this one sword clash that doesn't even last long, and most of the fight has noticeable jank. Grey has Esdeath on the ropes for a good while, then she counterattacks once and all of a sudden she's too much? You're telling me all it takes is one attack for Grey to use his I, I'm a head out move? What is it with this season and giving poor excuses for using a character's suicide move? The actual death is garbage, mostly because it didn't look like Grey was even dead, much like in our last icy battle. This episode is fine, but the average action, coupled with my disinterest, in the characters makes this one a skip for me. I could have gone my whole life without seeing Shirtless Boomstick. And you guys thought I looked bad in my birthday suit. Ah, why did you have to remind me of that? If I have to live with it, then so do you, buddy. Turd and wind. Venom vs. Krona. I'm a big Soul Eater fan, so I'm happy it finally got introduced to the show, but my god, could they have picked a more boring opponent for Krona? Instead of Venom getting a fight massively in his favor, now he has to fight someone whose main weapon exploits his weakness. From one end of the stomp spectrum to the other with this character, apparently. I will say, this episode handled Venom's personality much better than last time, and I like how his analysis spent more time on the symbiote's origin as opposed to just Eddie's. Though I wish the fight played more with the idea of two duos going at it, it would have been nice to have gotten some input from Eddie himself. Maybe have him try and keep Venom from fighting Krona initially to no avail. And Ragnarok seriously needed way more than just two measly lines. That's not enough to convey his boisterous personality. The atmosphere is what carries this episode for me. The music and especially the voice acting genuinely creep me out. Sarah Williams is without question the goat as Krona. She's great at selling Krona's meekness, as well as her borderline insanity. I get chills down my spine every time I hear this line. Your blood. I know. <laughs> It's black. What the fuck? I'm glad Adam Winnick was given a second chance to actually play Venom this time and not just discount Carnage, though at the end of the day, this episode is basically discount Carnage versus Lucy, which is hard to ignore. We even get a reference to that episode. The good things are done well, I've just seen them done better elsewhere. Aside from the voice acting, the fight lacks memorable moments, other than Ragnarok eating both of Venom's souls. That was a really cool attention to detail. Can't speak towards the Kate's research here like I'm sure others will, so I'm just gonna move on. <laughs> A na 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 hey now hey now huh na 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 hey na hen eh sorry.
Danny Phantom vs. Jake Long. I'm very happy this episode exists. The cartoons being used may not be my favorites, but this does mean we can expect to see more Western animation representation in the future, something that's been sorely lacking. This episode's music may be low-key, but I think it's a bop to listen to on its own. It almost makes me forget how badly Boomstick butchered both of the theme songs. Nicholas Andrew Louie and Dom Din fit their roles really well, and have fun banter that harkens back to the cheesiness of Danny and Jake's source materials. It feels good to see now, the Sean Bean of Death Battle finally get a win. Ironic that it took him playing a character that was already half dead to get one. It's a little odd that we got two Dante Bosco characters this season, and he only came back to play one of them, but I'm sure it was something to do with Disney. Besides, we got this show's first trans VA, which is really cool. The fight unfortunately doesn't pick up until after they leave the museum. Most of the animation in this section is stiff and makes the characters feel like they're operating with sticks up their ass. But once the fight's taken outside, the action becomes a lot more enjoyable thanks to their variety of abilities, especially this shot of their clones duking it out. It's really damn cool. Even though the death is just disintegration, it was a creative use of Danny's possession ability. <laughs> Though I'm not sure why Jake died to this and not the ghostly whale, Danny's most powerful move, which doesn't leave enough of an impact in this episode. Though Danny capturing Jake in the Fenton Thermos was a really charming way to end the fight. If this episode had more hand-drawn elements and more consistent action, it would probably be higher. I'm just glad it managed to pick up after that sneak peek. It left us all convinced that this episode would be a train wreck. Oh, but wait, this episode reminds me of Red vs. Blue Zero, an actual train wreck. Never mind, zero out of ten. But why out of all the episodes for an original creator to get involved? did it have to be this one? If the crew actually knew about Butch Hartman's less than agreeable behavior in the past, then I highly doubt he would have been welcomed to this degree. And then she ended up passing away, and uh, I think Tara actually had something to do with that, and so that's <laughs> probably what, that was probably your fault. Uh -huh. No, I'm kidding. That was probably your fault. That was probably your fault. Uh -huh. no. What in the Sam fuck? Don't talk to me. Genos vs. War Machine. How about that? I'm talking about the episode that should've been sprites immediately after the episode that should've been hand-drawn. Yes, it's generally agreed upon that this and Danny vs. Jake should've swapped animation teams, but I'm only here to discuss what is as opposed to what could've been. And unlike Batgirl vs. Spider-Gwen, Jordan Battle's team somewhat justify themselves working on their fight. Also, it managed to take a similarly uninteresting matchup and make it work, which is doubly impressive given it's the third comic fight of the season despite only being four episodes in. Trust me, we'll get to that. My opinion on this one has improved significantly over time. There are some really funny lines, such as... Need a hand? I already have one! With only a couple not making much sense. I don't fall apart that easy. Mark Allen Jr. is charismatic as War Machine, and Howard Wang does a great job with his first time as Genos. Ahem. <clears throat> first. Time. I like how Genos reassembling himself is synced with the music, the bitch slap was epic, and the variety of weaponry and firepower looks incredible, something Jordan's team clearly has a knack for. Maybe that's why they were given this one. It's surprisingly long for a hand-drawn fight, and it only really feels long near the end. We didn't need to see Genos use his incinerate move four times to get the point that he was screwed. Now that I think about it, it's weird he doesn't say incinerate at all. These clashing moments look off, and I would have preferred if the death was just Genos taking roads with him and ended there. I'm convinced that if Genos didn't have sass, he'd still be alive. But those problems don't bring this episode down that much. It's still a high-octane fight with a rocking track and well-written analysis segments. If Danny vs. Jake and Zuko vs. Shoto didn't exist, I sincerely believe the hate for this episode wouldn't be as intense. Hey. Miles Morales vs. Static. Wow, I completely forgot how terrifying those initial redesigns were for Wiz and Boomstick. The crew didn't even need to change that much about them. It was mostly just the overly detailed teeth, which can only work for artists that intentionally over-exaggerate this feature, a flaw that has tanked other designs in the past. Yeesh. Dude looks like he just got his braces removed and is showing off. Thank the lord they toned that down. Boomstick's mouth looks like it's being held together by plastic surgery, and Wiz was given unnecessary DSLs. Luckily, the crew listened and made improvements over time, but it did not do this episode any favors in the long run. Luckily, it doesn't ruin the analysis, which is pretty good. I'm glad they actually acknowledge that cartoon feats aren't canon to the comics this time. Where were you on that one, mister? An alternate timeline Wiz and Boomstick, effectively dubbed Jizz and Broomstick, is both a funny and completely cursed gag. Moving on to the actual fight, what we got was really good. Unlike our last Spider-themed episode, we actually got replications of the Spider-Verse style, and it does wonders in making this episode stand out. The puppet animation is the best of the season, and did a great job in making us think everything else would look like this. Spoiler, it didn't. Kai Jordan was good as Miles, and it was a pleasant surprise hearing Zeno Robinson on the show. You all know him as Hawks most likely, but I'm more of a Remy guy myself. 
finally, I'll fade away a happy salad dressing mogul. Blech. November 12th, 2094. 5.22 p.m. By the way, watch Big City Greens. It's really underrated. The electricity looked pretty, differentiating itself with colors much like Mob vs. Tatsumaki, and What's Up Danger is a banger track brought to us by the Chad JT Music. Hope to get more stuff from him on the show. Overall, a solid start to the season, as well as the first season premiere since Dante vs. Bayonetta to not be boring or ass. And now that we've all been reminded of Static Shock, give us a movie, DC! Or at the very least, bring back the cartoon. We're at the halfway point, so to make sure I leave no stone unturned or get an avalanche of inevitable comments, I might as well talk about the 7 Battle Royale. It's the show's first sponsored episode, and to its credit, it did get me to watch The Boys, which ironically worked against this episode's favor because I fucking despise it, and would probably only be neutral towards it if I hadn't seen The Boys. If we're counting this as a real episode, it's a solid contender for my least favorite of the show, at least cracking the top 15. The sprite work is fine, the fight is bare minimum competent, it's really a bunch of little things that, when added up, make this one a slog for me. If I have to hear the word simulation or only on Amazon Prime again, I might have to toss my PC out the window. I get why they only use the show and not the comic, but it made the results so painfully obvious. And that made this fight a tough beer to crack. A tough one to crack, huh? Maybe don't say that when presenting numbers these absurdly far apart and using a show with an already defined power scale. Why didn't Black Noir get to compete? What's the point of including Homelander when he has zero stage presence? Why didn't any of the other boys get to compete? Having it just be Billy makes it clear he's going to win, otherwise why even use him? Why in this beam struggle did Starlight not kill Billy when he moved his laser up? That's not how perspective works. Why didn't she and Maeve move out of the way of the slowly falling Billy? Building. Comedy is non-existent here. They reuse the don't talk shit about Vot gag almost as much as Boomstick's dad. You'd have to be blind to not know the Deep was immediately going to get bodied. Starlight saying fuck you is crazy out of character, and despite how transparent the result was, they felt the need to give this episode a more in-depth analysis than Hulk vs. Broly, Flash vs. Sonic, and Beerus vs. Galaxia combined. Even then, there are still some questionable things. Why did Billy get to use the Laser Baby, a weapon that was literally used in one scene and should definitely not be considered a part of his standard arsenal. If Starlight's beams are made of plasma just like the babies, then why aren't hers just as powerful? Why did you bring attention to A-Train being better than Starlight despite the fact he died before her in the... <sighs> Simulation. This episode is stupid, annoying, and possibly the unfunniest death battle of the show. But like I said, it did get me to watch The Boys, and I am appreciative of that. Dollars to Donuts if that episode came out this year, they would have replaced Not Storm with J.K. Soups. Fake Nate. Tell me I'm wrong. Time travel is bullshit. Cable versus Booster Gold. A Marvel versus DC fight that I actually enjoyed. Not only that, but one that seemed ridiculously boring on paper. Not only that, but another episode that deals with time? This episode has no right being as fun as it is. A big part of what makes this episode fun is Cable and Booster's dynamic. A gritty badass against a silly goofball writes itself in terms of comedy, and the voice actors clearly had a fun time. Dave J. Dixon somehow made this line sound cool. You went like a girl. Rico Fajardo has always excelled as over-the-top characters like Booster, though did anyone else notice his voice is possibly being pitch-shifted? <laughs> thank you! Thank you! Could just be me. Despite both characters using time travel, it's actually implemented really well in a way that isn't as stupid as our last Timey Wimey episode. The analysis segment has plenty of funny jokes poking fun at Cable's story and Booster's personality. I find it super thematic and fitting that Booster, a hero I had never heard of, came in with the biggest upset of the season. A good one to revisit from time to time, that for some reason has one of the most unironically amazing deaths in the show. Seriously, why is it this cool? And to think, my bestest buddy decided to leave me out of his fight to the death. I mean, it makes sense. Otherwise, your character development would have been null and void from your last episode. Character Schmerichter. I missed my chance to say the funny time me. You can say it now if you'd like. Nah, it's never as funny if it's expected. But if I were to go back in time to before I mentioned it... Wade... I know, Deadpool 2 paradox. At least I didn't go through with killing baby Hitler. Who's Hitler? Wait, how do you... Ah, oh, dang it, Cable! Devil for mitzvah, spooky, scary, boys becoming men, men becoming wolves. 
Saberwolf vs. John Tell Bane. I really wish I could put this one higher. If it weren't for the really slow choreography and odd sound design at the start, it would probably make the top five. Luckily, much like Danny vs. Jake, once the momentum picked up, it didn't look back. Except this time to an even greater degree. The analysis bits are some of the best this season, showing a lot of genuine love for two series that deserve more of it, especially Darkstalkers, which hadn't been on the show for 126 episodes, a record for dormant franchises on Death Battle. Now, if only Capcom could follow suit. There were great gags like 34 Reasons, and Dummy as a Doggo is too dang cute. Moving on from cuteness, this fight is mercilessly brutal. Our fighters get torn apart, lit up, combo broken, and given a friendly reminder of what entrails look like. Chris Guerrero is great as always, and Brendan Blaber makes his Death Battle debut in the best way possible. And yes, I am referring to that Brendan. Welcome to the wonderful world of Pokemon. In the new games, Pokemon Ketchup and Mustard. I'm Professor Tree, and I'm gonna ask you what your gender is. The dude's got range, what can I say? I'm no monster, but tonight, I'll make an exception. Pretty much everything that happens in the graveyard is 10 out of 10 material, and of course I'm including the death, which has rightfully garnered a reputation as the most insanely sadistic one on the show, thanks to the purposeful color choices, line delivery, and intense music. Could I ask for anything more? Well, yeah, if the whole fight had been like this, it'd be an easy 10, but the stuff that is good ranks up there with some of Death Battle's finest moments. For his neutral special, he wields a gun. Winter Soldier vs. Red Hood. Talk about a glow up in almost every way from this show's last live action battle. I don't even care that it's Marvel vs. DC. This rocked. Everything from the camera work, choreography, story, and dialogue was a great improvement. The Red Hood costume looks like it comes right out of the movies, but not even the MCU can compete with this episode's fantastic knife and gunplay. Everything about the crowbar scene is perfect. The Joker's voice is great. It's a creative way to show the difference in their mental stabilities, and pitching Jason's voice higher as if he was a kid again is a great touch. Tyler Tackett and Tim Neff pull off some really cool stunts, and Tim in particular is great at portraying Jason's dickish attitude. But this episode isn't perfect. My first issue is admittedly just a nitpick. While some have said Winter Soldier doesn't get enough to do, I for one think they didn't go far enough. Part of Bucky's draw is his mysteriousness, and they would have done a better job portraying that if he'd kept the mask on the whole time, or at least until the very end. And then there's the death, an actual glaring problem. Oh, okay. There is no build up to it, we don't get enough time to process what happened, and if Bucky had been strong enough to crush his head from the beginning, how did he not kill him here? Despite the analysis being entertaining, the ending is pretty lame. Not unlike Zuko vs. Shoto, it somehow fails at justifying the result of a matchup that has a generally agreed upon consensus. The lack of numbers and reliance on hypotheticals feels more at home in season 1. I look forward to seeing more live action stuff eventually, because this crew is able to pull off some incredible stuff. If they could just figure out a good way to finish off their fights consistently, we could honestly get something as good as Ganondorf vs. Dracula or even Snake vs. Sam. Until then, I'm content with what we have at the moment. I was always more of a Leonardo guy myself. Leonardo vs. Red Ranger Jason. Who would have guessed that the key to getting a Power Rangers dub was getting them out of those pesky zords? One of the best aspects of this fight is how much it embraces the 90s, which makes sense given these two characters were at the forefront of playground debates around that time. The glorious synthetic music, the dialogue, even the over-the-top sound effects of Boomstick eating cereal add to this aesthetic. I'm also pretty sure the ending pun was a reference to one of the most infamous ad campaigns of the 90s. His Ranger of Abilities does what Leonard don't. <laughs> Nintendo. What Scrooge vs. Shovel Knight did for the 8-bit era, this battle did for the 16-bit era. The fight was solidly animated and had a great sense of flow. There was never a part that left me bored. That includes learning Jason may or may not be discriminatory. I appreciate the decision to include multiple iterations of Leo's so that no one feels left out. Rise of the TMNT gang, where you at? And this attitude applies to John Allen's voice direction as Leo. Same goes for Alejandro Saab who once again does a one-to-one -one impression of Jason. Really, the only problem I have with this episode is that it comes as soon as it goes. If it was maybe 30 seconds longer, we could have a 10 on our hands, but that doesn't stop this episode from being a short but sweet action-packed duel of chiptune glory. The Flash! What the sh Fucking Sonic! <laughs> Flash vs. Sonic. Full disclosure, I don't read Archie comics. People warned me that things would get crazy, but crazy was kind of underselling the mind-bogglingly insane crap I'd be subjected to in this episode, and I am all for it. The analysis was great at covering these characters in a way that at least makes some sense, and it's great seeing all three hosts gradually get just as confused as the audience. Compared to the last Flash episode, this one is miles better. For one, the fight actually feels fast, and the choice to have things take place on the cosmic highway and 
Lost Sonic Mania level was a clever way of showing these two are going all out. The banter in this episode is some of this show's best. I still like to use some of the insults on my friends from time to time. Dude, I keep telling you, my suit is maroon. Whatever you say, cherry flavored chump. Ugh. And this dialogue is brought to life by Joshua Waters and Nicholas Andrew Louis expertly, the latter of whom thankfully reprises his role as Sonic once again. Granted, a certain line or two could have used a bit of tweaking, and maybe a second take. Nice try, but I'm invincible when I'm like this. You've mastered speed, but I've mastered fate, and I wish you gone forever! This is the final battle. Show yourself. Our new ruler, the Emperor! I mean, I think I could come up with a line more in character than that. Give me a second. <clears throat> Pretty impressive, Thunder Thighs. You might have me beaten speed, but I've got fate on my side. How about I show you yours? Whoa, you ever considered being a voice actor? No can do. This face is meant to be in front of a camera. This may not be the longest fight of the season, but it goes for quality over quantity with some ridiculously beautiful set pieces and hand-drawn elements. Everything about Sonic sprites makes me so happy, and I feel like an animation student could have a field day studying its many facial expressions and mannerisms. Way Past Flash is an adrenaline-pumping banger that captures this fight's speed flawlessly, and I especially love that it incorporates live and learn in the most epic way possible. There's no way to describe this battle's climax as anything other than pure chaos. Sonic getting punched so hard that he relived his whole life looks and sounds fantastic, and it might be my favorite death of the season. This episode may be a 10, but it's on the lower end of the 10 spectrum. I would have liked more of that fun banter and more abilities, and the ending didn't really succeed at showing us this was a 51 to 49 victory on Flash's part, but it's still a 10 for me regardless, with some of the best art this show has produced sprite-wise, which is saying a lot. Also, Boomstick might be a fan of Ninja Sex Party. Just a theory, at least. No apparent reason, boners? That was the wrong kind of package to mail. They're devious. From here on out, each episode is a solid contender for my top 10 of the whole show, so the order is honestly kind of arbitrary and could change on a dime, with the exception of number one. Obi-Wan Kenobi vs. Kakashi Hitake. Before this episode, Star Wars was in a very similar boat as Avatar in that it's a great franchise with death battle episodes that do not reflect that quality one bit, which is why it pleases me to say that we finally got the death battle episode Star Wars fans deserve. There were really funny jokes in the analysis, and I love how well in Obi-Wan's they balance the memes with unironic respect for the character. I'd posit this episode's fight as one of the most universally loved of the season, and proof that the SFM team does wonders when they're given the right matchup, and Ganondorf versus Dracula was not a fluke. It's because this episode exists that I don't let back went off easy. We know they can make realistic faces look good. We know that hand-to-hand -hand can have weight. And we know this team can move beyond that classic SFM jank by giving us incredible character moments. Obi-Wan was handled beautifully. Even though he speaks almost exclusively in meme quotes, every single line pertains to the situation at hand and doesn't feel forced. Stephen Kelly has pretty much proven himself as Death Battle's vocal chameleon. He really nails Ewan McGregor's charm. I don't watch Naruto, but I was entertained by Kakashi's character as well, thanks to Nicholas Andrew Louis' performance. Seeing the insane force and ninja powers reminded me of why SFM excels at these types of bouts. They give us some of Death Battle's coolest and destined to be iconic moments of choreography and character interaction. What can I even say about the Genjutsu scene that hasn't already been said? It's literally perfect, though this episode isn't. There is a bit more jank compared to the last SFM fight, some of the lines have odd delivery, and while the death had amazing buildup, the actual blow was kinda weak. But that doesn't dampen this episode so it's incredible animation, music, atmosphere, and fun. I totally get why this episode tops so many people's lists. A point of view that's clearly not held by 37,000 other people. That was for my ice cream. Beerus vs. Sailor Galaxia Before we discuss the actual episode, I'd like to praise the crew's decision to pick Beerus as the team's combatant at the end of this season's first half. With the format change came a whole summer of pure speculation, and it was a lot of fun specifically because Beerus has so many possible opponents. They could have picked Hades, Ashura, Arceus, 
Thanos. Krona would have been a good choice for this role as well, but I feel like all that buildup would have made the Venom reveal even more disappointing, and Galaxia was definitely the best choice because it was the most fair, has great potential for banter, introduces a new franchise, and features complementary colors. Onto the fight itself, it's indisputably the best Sprite episode of the season. This one marks an important milestone in terms of franchises being used. It's Sailor Moon's debut, one of the most influential anime of all time, and it's our first true look into Dragon Ball's brand new upgrades and power scaling. The analysis is fantastic, and introduces Dummy for the first time. One of the most obvious signs a show is decaying is when a new character is added to the cast, but it doesn't feel like a cling to relevancy at all here, and more like a fun new addition. After all, Wiz and Boomstick are still as front and center as Wiz's search history. Not to mention Dummy is a sweetheart, and I would die for him. The fight makes so many purposeful decisions that set it apart from any other episode. It's the only fight to take place exclusively in space, and somehow doesn't feel empty and boring thanks to both fighters' grandiose abilities. I love how they both start with their finishing moves and only fight for real once they've realized they've met worthy opponents. Blythe Renee is great at capturing Galaxia's campy arrogance, but the real star is River Kanaf as Beerus. While I was originally expecting Tomar as our Purple Cat Destroyer, I'm more than okay with what we got. It's practically identical to Jason Douglas's performance in tone and personality. He captures Beerus' laziness, arrogance, dorkiness, and intimidating presence all together, and it's a solid contender for the best individual voice acting performance of the show. On top of having really epic moments, this fight is also really funny. Beerus immediately destroying the planet he fell on had me in stitches, and paints a clear difference in his and Galaxia's personalities. This battle also has two separate moments that gave me chills. The first is the supernova, coinciding perfectly with the battle track's epic guitar riff. And the second is of course the death, where Beerus says, Now you're catching on. I am the impossible! You see, Mega Man Battle Royale? That's how you make black holes impactful. There's very little I could say negative about this one, and the fact that I only have it at number four should speak volumes to how much I love the next three entries. Four arms. Goro vs. Machamp. Or Machamp featuring Goro, depending on who you're asking. Okay, so I should probably address something. In my last video, I called this match a joke episode, and a lot of people took issue with that. First of all, just because something is a joke, that doesn't mean it's bad. Second, I should have worded myself better when I called this an absurd mismatch. I wasn't trying to say that it's a joke episode for being one-sided. As Nemesis has plainly shown us, if that were an actual criteria, then almost every episode would be considered a joke. And Goro vs. Machamp doesn't even come close to this show biggest stomps, which is really sad. What was that they were saying about how Namor could win sometimes? Are those the times that Aquaman has a stroke the moment the battle starts and dies of poor health? What I meant by mismatch was how tonally different these two characters are. One comes from kid-friendly Pokemon, the other comes from over-the-top violent Mortal Kombat. So I'd like to propose a new term for episodes like these, the oddball matchup, with other examples including Yoshi vs. Riptor and Starscream vs. Rainbow Dash. Cool? Cool, now to talk about what really matters. Because holy hell, this fight kicks more ass than a six-legged robotic ass-kicking machine with the kick asses dial set to 11. This has joined the ranks of Balrog vs. TJ Combo, Ryu vs. Jin, and All Might vs. My Guys, a fantastic showcase of man's greatest weapons, our fists. And since these guys both have two extra arms, that must mean four times the awesomeness. That's not how math works. But I can definitely appreciate a good old round of punchy punch. Mano a mano, hand to hand, face to fist. It just gets me so hyped. <laughs> Calm down. Quiet beaches. Jane Austen. Machamp is probably one of the best portrayals of any death battle fighter we've ever had. They managed to give what is essentially a wild animal such a well-defined and Chad-like personality. I mean, this dude broke into someone's home to pile drive them as high as the moon and then double dab over their limp body. And just like with Miles, I don't find stuff like this cringy because it's a totally in-character thing for them to do. Now, if Goro was dabbing, then we'd have a problem. The fact that the crew was dedicated enough to hire Keston Howard just to say Machamp countless times is proof enough that they wanted to make Machamp your new favorite Pokemon, and it kind of worked. While this does technically mean Machamp outshines Goro, it's not like Goro wasn't given cool moments at all. He had some impactful punches as well as an x-ray, and while there understandably wasn't a lot of banter, this single exchange he and Machamp had was freaking perfect. Machamp! Stop saying that! You're no champ! I am! the champion of Mortal Kombat! Four Fist Death Punch is my favorite track of the season, and it takes the title with surprisingly little effort. It's fitting for the match and is great to listen to on its own. Some people complain that the ending gives away the winner. To that I say... I mean, for God's sake, 
God's sake, who does that, you stupid piece? And come on, it's Red's theme remixed with one of the most powerful guitar riffs I've ever heard. And said riffs also serve to make each punch feel even more powerful. Everything about the track synergy with the fight is honestly perfect, and I've looped the climax more times than I'm proud to admit. I like how even though Machamp loses an arm, he keeps fighting from pure adrenaline, which at least makes more sense than Sanji's no cell. And him fainting after the battle concludes is hysterical. That thumbs up he gives to the camera would make All Might proud. I suppose this fight technically isn't perfect. While Machamp's model is incredible, Goro's is a little wonky in stills. He doesn't get nearly as much spotlight as Machamp, and despite this being the 125th episode, it doesn't really feel like like a milestone episode, though you could argue it is given how much history the matchup has, as well as the surprisingly uplifting message of body positivity delivered by Boomstick at the end. The fact of the matter is, this episode's choreography, character portrayal, music, and badassery are on a whole nother level, making any and all nitpicks quite frankly trivial in the long run. Between this and Lucario vs. Blaziken, I think it's safe to say that Pokemon is back to being badass again. It's about time. The devil. Oh my god, he's so god! Cool. Hulk vs. Broly. I'm saying this right now, Hulk vs. Broly is incredible. Firstly, when it comes to how worthy this episode is of being a finale, there's not much debate. It feels grander than any other fight this season. It manages to be both a legacy and recent debate at the same time thanks to their new material, and Hulk pretty much got cucked out of a finale last time. I'm really happy they used Doomsday earlier and not Broly, because his latest movie is nothing short of a triumph in animation, and it would've sucked missing out on it. It also served to make this matchup way more thematic than before. Hulk vs. Broly probably has my favorite analysis segments of the season. We get some of the most consistently funny, respectful, and visually engaging material in this show's history. Hulk's editing makes the last two comic episodes feel like warm-ups in comparison. Don't say it. Among us! It's not just the visual flair, but also the choice in music drops. It makes moments like Satan magic stick out in a really impactful way. This mindset even shows up in Broly's section. The moment they talk about Paragus' death reminds me of why I got so emotional the first time I watched it on the big screen. The cutaway gags are also incredibly funny. One of them even pulls off the astronomical feat of making a Boomstick's dad joke humorous. Now that's a joke I haven't laughed at in a long time. But the analysis, as we all know, is one side of the coin. Was the fight worth the buildup? Uh, speaking of build up. I'm sorry, I really need to gush about this. This fight is just so flippin' hype for me. Hulk was my favorite hero when I was a kid, and he's throwing hands with one of my favorite anime movie's main characters. It's like they just decided to take everything that made me excited and blend it up to make a fight that would make my childhood self have a seizure from happiness. And the green. There's so much green in this fight. I don't know if you couldn't tell, but I really love green. And they used each other's catchphrases, which was just the right amount of campy and kind of adorable. Well, as adorable as green rage monsters can be. And the freaking soundtrack. It sounded like it belonged to an actual anime. And they did Broly's pupil shattering thing, too. That was like my favorite part of the movie. And then there was that one part in the middle where they're punching each other in the face and throwing each other around. And it was in perfect time with the song I picked up the season 7 AFI I did. <laughs> didn't even play that out, it's like they knew! They also had a whole student teacherish dynamic thing between the Hulk and Broly, and it was so cool! It felt like he was trying to train Broly on how to be a giant green raid monster. And they had this head cannon that the reason Hulk lost to Broly was because his pride for Broly overpowered his anger, and it just made the fight so much better for me! They even had a reference to Broly wiping up the South Galaxy for the first Broly movie! And how they just kept bashing their heads together, and each head bash kept shattering reality more, and it was just, gah! This is genuinely my favorite fight death battle's ever done. Yeah, Goku versus Superman, second place, deep thrown to my head. This one is just the perfect mix of hype, childhood, nostalgia, not stop with some violence over the top scale, just everything felt perfect. I genuinely don't think they could top this for me. I don't know how. <laughs> what, what, what he said. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna lie down for a bit. Really tired from fanboying. Well, 
I can't say I blame you. It's not just the planet-level explosions and attacks that make me love this one, it's also the little things. The way their eyes change when in trouble, the sweat from being attacked, the gorgeous visuals of Broly's power-up. It's not hard to believe this fight took a whole year to animate, and the Ruby animators killed it. What you can do with these characters is really only limited to imagination and budget. Even then, they still adhere to certain rules like how Hulk can't fly. So during the space section, he only moves when Broly attacks or when using the momentum of the explosion. An attention to detail I'm sure most people would have ignored. While I'm surprised the Hulk's VA changed from last time, there's something about Richard Barsanos's voice that feels more raw than the previous performance. And of course, Nicholas Andrew Louis dances with death yet again and perfectly captures our gentle giant. Somebody get these two an herbal tea! They've earned it. Broly tearing Hulk's head off was a genius callback to the previous fight, and having it happen earlier shows how much stronger Hulk has gotten. I'm basically convinced Hulk vs. Doomsday would be a stalemate if it got redone. Another great thing about this being the finale is that it gives the animators an excuse to go all out. As discussed previously, Death Battle tends to have trouble conveying the actual power levels of the fighters by downplaying the amount of collateral damage. Hulk vs. Doomsday is still great, but the most that gets destroyed is a couple measly buildings, so it's nice to see two universe destroyers actually destroy the universe, as well as reality for that matter. But I'd like to round things off by discussing my favorite aspect. Not the Loki reference, not the thunderclap, not the planet-sized key, not even testosterone incarnate. I'm talking about the dynamic of our fighters. Broly is simply minding his own business, taking time to appreciate the fauna around him, when all of a sudden that peace gets interrupted in an eerily similar way to when Doomsday crashed on Earth. Broly may be mad, but he doesn't attack immediately. He's simply like, dude, you're pissing me off, just walk away and nothing has to happen. The way Hulk's personality was handled is really clever. Most of us are used to Savage Hulk, but given the kind of stuff Hulk's analysis covered, we got the devil for this fight. A malevolent being curious of the idea of being challenged. This is why he goads Broly into striking first to get a good sense of his power. This would also explain explain the light punches at the beginning. He didn't want to immediately defeat him, otherwise where's the fun in that? Unfortunately for Hulk, he underestimated Broly, who now is taking the fight more seriously by powering up. But since this is Devil Hulk, he's not scared, but excited to have found another being fueled by emotion, which is why he keeps poking and prodding the beast to go further beyond. The exchange that stuck with me the most has to be when they went into their final forms. The death and destruction all around him is everything Hulk could have asked for, but Broly, who never wanted to fight to begin with and has essentially been toyed with this whole time says I'll kill you! everything about this one line as well as the delivery is perfect. While Hulk fights to have fun, Broly fights to survive. Hulk may be slightly more over the top with his rage, but you can hear in the single sentence that Broly has officially been pushed past the breaking point and is ready to end it. I seriously can't praise these voice actors enough. Finally, I'd like to address the confusion surrounding the death. Yes, it's jarring, but there is a reason for it. From a tone perspective, we're going to need a moment of tranquility as an audience after the manliest thing ever. And from a story perspective, they must have broken reality at least 25 times in a row. Odds are at least one of those breaks would set the universe back to normal. Either that or Wheeze stepped in. Take your pick. Plus, seeing Broly smile after being reunited with his dear friends is the most wholesome thing ever and deserves to exist. If this fight is how the world is destined to end, then I'd be 100% on board. Before we move on to number one, I'd like to talk about this season as a whole and how it ranks with the rest of the show. Why now? Fuck you, that's why. When compared to our last two seasons, and even season two, season seven quite frankly doesn't hold a candle. There were plenty of fantastic episodes this season, but the ratio of bad to good is much more shaky. And you can't blame the increase in episode count because season two has 12 more episodes and still manages to be more consistent. The puppet animation had so much potential and was set to be really good, but they dropped the ball with it so many times. Enough to make me question how much time and money they could have saved if they focused their resources onto something else. It's been said a million times before by a million different people, but it can't be overstated how annoying the Marvel and DC oversaturation was. Death Battle has the opportunity to pull from a wealth of interesting and unique intellectual properties, and yet they go out of their way to keep dipping their toes into the same two universes over and over again. It takes the excitement out of long-requested fights like Hulk vs. Broly, and turns other fights like Batgirl vs. Spider-Gwen into punchlines purely on announcement. Even good episodes like Miles vs. Static and Cable vs. Booster are forced to fight uphill battles for the simple fact that they're Marvel vs. DC. With half of this 20-episode season facing this problem, Death Battle literally couldn't go more than two episodes without using Marvel or DC. And that, my friends, is why comics have gotten such a bad rep on this show. That being said, this is not the worst season. Season 1 is still bogged down by age, and Season 3 is... 
well, season three. The main question to answer is do I prefer this season or Death Battle's other mixed bag, season four? Honestly, I think I prefer this one. While both seasons have plenty of good, this season simply has a bit more good for me. Plus, season four doesn't have dummies, so that's an automatic disqualification. Season seven has its ups and downs and has plenty of valid criticisms, but I think it does just enough good to justify its existence. Now then, on to number one. You'll never guess what it is. Death battle. Red versus blue. Man, if I had a nickel for every time I cucked Hulk out of a number one spot on my lists in favor of a Red vs. Blue episode, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Yes, I promise this is for real and not a trick like last time. I know that a lot of people are going to disagree with me on this, but I might as well proclaim this loud and proud. Red vs. Blue is my favorite episode of the season, and I'm not afraid to admit a lot of this comes down to my love for Red vs. Blue as a show. This entire thing is one gigantic love letter that's tailor-made for viewers like me. I could gush about the anime the writing, the references, the everything for hours. Dude, look at how long this video is. Oh crap, you're right. You should have known talking about every episode would take too long. What's the plan now, Nate? Well, Wade, there's only one thing we can do. You're gonna make people wait for another video, aren't you? Hey, at least this time they know what my actual favorite episode is. Well, as long as your audience is ready for it, at least this time they won't be left with a case of the blues. Did somebody say blues? Caboose, get, get the, the f out of here! here. Okay, bye, I don't want to be in the video anymore.